now, here is your host, Ryan. There is highly politicized dispute over the guilt or innocence, as well as whether or not the trials are fair. The dispute focuses on small details and contradictory evidence. But personally, I think what these men did was wrong, and they should be held accountable for it. Now to Sarah, with other news. Reporting live from Daytown, Tennessee, on the final and latest news in the Scopes trial, otherwise known as the Monkey Trial. But first, what spark ignited this wildfire? Well, that match was struck earlier this March with the passing of the statute by Tennessee legislature, which made it unlawful for any teacher in any educational institution supported by the public school funds to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of a man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that a man descended from a lower order of animals. The statute further stated that any teacher violating the section shall be guilty of a misdemeanor. This brings us to John T. Spokes, who was indicted for teaching evolution. He was defended by Clarence Darrow and prosecuted by William Jennings Bryan. It looks like court just adjourned, and here comes our man to give us a scoop on this riveting trial. Hello, William. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> what happened in that courtroom? Well, Nancy. It is Nancy, right? It's Clark. Oh, yes, Clark. I'd say a guilty man got everything that was coming to him. What is that exactly? A hundred dollar fine. And a good deal of humiliation. Really? Because my sources say you were a little shaken, to say the least, with Jaro's defense. Oh, uh, I think I see someone very important waving at me over there. Yes, uh, Are thank you, Jaro. Uh, yes. uh, oh. uh. It's Barb! <laughs> Rightly so, ma'am. Why is that? My mom always told me that school was just like church, except with math and writing. I sure as f want my youngest thing to maybe coming from monkeys and whatnot. The good Lord put us on this earth, and that's what should be taught. That teacher would have shown his place, which is fine by me. And how about you, ma'am? Yes, ma'am, well, I'll say so. But it seems to me those two lawyers got most of the attention, rather that quirky teacher. What was your impression of William James Bryant's persecution? Oh boy, our man got a whooping. He looked like a plain fool, that one. That girl is as smart as a whip. I'll go that. Thank y'all for your time. For the craziness of this trial, we have recently heard and presently inferred cast an unfortunate ridicule on the fundamentalist cause, but for now, our schools are safe from the evolution and test tubes. As a result of today's groundbreaking news, we are in the studio today. Known as the Teapot Dome scandal, new details and truths are coming in from all directions. Let's begin with what most of us already know, and later our expert will break it all down for us and bring in some fresh perspective. Origins of the scandal date back to the popular conservation legislation of Presidents Teddy Roosevelt, William Taft, and Woodrow Wilson, specifically as the creation of Naval Petroleum Reserves in Wyoming and California. Three naval oil fields, Elk Hills and Buena Vista Hills in California and Teapot Dome in Wyoming, were tracts of public land that were reserved by previous presidents to be emergency underground supplies to be used by the Navy only when regular oil supplies diminished. Many politicians and private oil interests had opposed the restriction placed on the oil fields, claiming that the reserves were unnecessary and that the American oil companies could provide for the U.S. Navy. To jump on in and tell us what we don't know, Ebenezer McLaughlin. How are you, Ebenezer? Fine, thank you. So many viewers at home have probably heard the name Albert E. Ball. What can you tell us about that man is and his involvement in the Teapot Dome scandal. Well, you certainly don't start off easy. Albert B. Fall was one of the politicians who opposed the conservation, and he became Warren Harding's Secretary of the Interior. On becoming the Secretary of the Interior, Fall convinced uh, Secretary of the Navy Edwin Dimby to turn the control of the oil fields over to him. An action was considered by some remarkable, by others defeat. Deceiving? Why is that so? 
It gave him an unprecedented amount of power, and to my knowing, Edmund Dimby was completely unaware of his ulterior motives. What did Baldy next? He proceeded to move the lease for the Teapot Dome. To Harry Sinclair's Mammoth Oil Company and the Elk Hills Reserve to Edward Doheny's Pan American Petroleum Company. This risky maneuver may, must have come at a price. What did he gain in return? Right you are. In return for leasing these oil fields to respective oil magnates, Fall received gifts, or as most would call it, bribes, for the oil men totaling about $400,000. What led to his discovery? A number of things. First, his style of living increased to say the least, and a committee from the U.S. Senate investigated him. Finally, to most people's astonishment, Albert Fall had made legislature had made legitimate leases of the oil fields to the private companies, but the taking of the money was his undoing. Well, Ebenezer, thank you for your time. It's been a real pleasure. My pleasure. Well, Ebenezer certainly made things a lot easier to understand. Currently, Doheny and Sinclair are in police custody and charges are being pressed against them. Fall is accused of taking bribe and his sentence is unknown at the moment. Now to Emily with other news. Thanks, Ryan. Prohibition, which was enacted in the 18th Amendment in 1920, has caused many changes in America today. The crime rate has dramatically increased. We see more crime today than we have ever seen before. Today we also hear a new term, speakeasies. They are supposedly underground bars and the name comes from its visitors having to speak softly so the police won't find them. Although it has been reported that some police are willing to turn the other cheek, for a small bribe. On the opposite spectrum, there are crime-fighting agents like Elliot Ness. This spot is where Mr. Ness made one of his infamous undercover raids. Ness and his group of undercover investigators have been nicknamed the Untouchables for their ability to catch high-profile criminals like Chicago mobster Al Capone, who was recently linked to the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Speakeasies are one of the many illegal things that are going on in our country right now. Most of them are said to be in the bigger cities like Chicago and New York, but, only, but one only wonders how long it will take for them to reach more rural places like our small town. The latest on the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Last night, the issue of unorganized crime reached a breaking point. This happened when members of mobster Al Capone's gang allegedly organized an attack on five rival gangs. It occurred in a Chicago garage where the rival gangs were executed, as well as a doctor and a reporter who happened to be on the scene. I'm here with Maria Capone, Al Capone's cousin. Hi, Mrs. Capone. Thank you for meeting with me. You're welcome. Can you please tell me what your cousin, Mr. Capone, is like? Well, he's a stern man, and I don't see him often. He's usually on the job. Does he tell you what his jobs involve? No, that part of his life is very private. He almost keeps everything hidden from us. What was your reaction to, be, to what is being called the St. Valentine's Day Massacre? I still don't believe it was my cousin. He does his fair share of bad things, but he denies about his gang that one thing to do is that I chose to believe in him. Do you think the police could ever find enough evidence to put against your cousin? I don't think they ever will. They search, they can search and search, but my cousin is smart and he takes everything seriously. Do you know anything about your cousin's relationship with John Torino? I don't know much, just that him and my cousin are very close. He's the reason that we moved from Chicago to New York. Him and my cousin since have taken over the family business, which has proved a lot, provided a lot for my family. Interesting. Would you connect any of the crimes that have been going on to prohibition? I absolutely would. I am very conservative in my ways, but I believe that the government should have stayed traditional. I think the absence of alcohol has also made things worse. Thank you for your time, Mrs. Capone. You are quite welcome. Crime in cities has dramatically increased since prohibition. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre proves this. How can we protect ourselves in our traditional ways if we fear for our lives? Now for a short commercial break. Hey there, Johnny. Have you heard of these new Ford Model T automobiles? What? 
You mean you haven't heard of the newest Ford motor cars? Well then, chap, listen on up. These new buggies use the latest technology from the mind of the great inventor Henry Ford himself. Reaching dizzyingly fast speeds of up to 30 miles per hour, it practically defies physics. You won't ever be late to another party again. And Model T motor cars are perfectly safe, having been safety proofed and tested around the clock by the most modern of scientists. Jeepers! Well then how do I get one, mister? Easy, Johnny. Simply go down for it. Oh, you'll feel good. The Model T is the easiest to use and most affordable motor car available. With just a few lessons in proper operation and training, you'll be riding around in style in no time. comedy. The British actor and director is most recognized as the icon often associated with his popular Little Tramp character, the man with the toothbrush mustache, bowler hat, bamboo cane, and funny walk. Charlie Chaplin is here tonight and I have some questions for him. In 1919, you co-founded the United Artist Film Distribution Company with Mary Pickford, Douglas Fairbanks, and W.D. Griffith. Why? We were seeking to escape the growing power of consolidation of film distributors and financiers in Hollywood. What did this move do for your career? It assured my independence in filmmaking. Do you have any movies coming out soon? The Gold Rush just came out in 1925 and The Circus is due to come out in 1928. You are a very popular character in our society, doing things for publicity purposes. You have been rumored to be romantically involved with many different women. How does this affect your career? Uh, I would uh, rather not discuss my sexual relations with women. Okay. Thank you, Charlie Chaplin. That is all for tonight. Next, we will be talking about Duke Ellington. Our next entertainment piece covers Duke Ellington. Edward Kennedy Ellington, otherwise known in our culture as Duke Ellington, is a great American pianist, band leader, and composer. His distinct Ellington sound is evident in his popular songs, Mood Indigo, and I Don't Mean a Thing If You Ain't Got That Swing. We're now going to interview one of Ellington's fans who's going to be at his show tonight. <laughs> what do you think of Ellington's music? It's just so wonderful. Me and Tallulah love his music, don't we? Yes, we do. We and why do you think it's called the American music? Because it's like the soul of America. Well, you just enjoy the show tonight. Thank you. Ellington started his music career when he was seven, learning to play the piano. He then started playing with his group, the Duke Sir. Oh, how do you? Say he started his music career when he was seven, learning to play the piano. He then started playing with his group, the Duke Serenaders, in D.C., then moving to Harlem where his career took off, sending him to the ex exclusive club and then to the Hollywood club. His jazz music is American music because, it's, because it is the soul of our country. Duke Ellington is truly a great musician. We could not get our interview with him today because he is busy warming up playing for his gig tonight. 